Hi, everyone. Welcome. It's really a great, wonderful pleasure to welcome Stephen Burks for the inaugural lecture this fall. Every fall for the past five years, actually, we've hosted a conversation around the question of making and architecture. Uh, the series included Building Cultures last year, which was organized by Empo Mitsipa. In 2018, we organized Thinking Through Making with Lotech. And uh, before that, in 2017, looked at subject object making in New York City, looking at all of the kind of fabrication labs that had emerged uh, with Josh Jordan. But tonight I, is a kind of culmination uh, uh, in this kind of moment that we're in. And I really wanted to expand this question beyond making for the scale of architecture uh, to rather explore the question of making at the scale of design, the scale of the hand, of the body, the scale of industrial and furniture design as a way to recast the question of the relationship of design to architecture and the relationship to craft, of craft to design. And so there's no better person to kind of answer or start to explore with us some of these questions than Stephen. Uh, in this, what I'm hoping, we're hoping together will be, not only did we share backgrounds, or rather I'm using one of Stephen's uh, <laughs> background, the homage to Sotsas uh, on the day of his birthday, um, but to just have a conversation uh, with Stephen rather than uh, a lecture. I would say that uh, it certainly uh, needs to be said that Stephen is one of the most celebrated designers of his generation. His practice, Stephen Burke's Man Made, has collaborated uh, with many of the most important design-driven brands around the world, from BNB Italia to Capellini, Moroso, Roche Beaubois, and many others. Uh, your work, Stephen, has been exhibited at the Armory Show, Art Basel Design Miami, the Cooper, Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, uh, the, Phila uh, the, the Mad Museum of Art, the Philadelphia Art Museum, and so many more. And more importantly, even you've kind of kind of recast what is design or industrial design today with a real emphasis on craft, build, build, you know, working with a network of artisans and around the world uh, and working with the Nature Conservancy, Design Network Africa and many others. You're also a researcher and an educator. Uh, school. <laughs> Scoop, uh, we might have Stephen in the spring. Don't tell any other school before. <laughs> <laughs> you studied um, architecture at uh, IIT and product design at IIT's Institute of Design, as well as attending Columbia's GSAP. And I want to hear a little bit about that later. Um, you've spent many years traveling between New York and Europe. You've lived in Tokyo and Milan. And by the way, even under COVID, Every time I've seen Stephen or spoken to Stephen this summer, he was either in Mexico City or somewhere in Ar Kentucky. Or <laughs> I, I first encountered Stephen's work when he was awarded the Smith 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 Sonian Cooper Hewitt National Design Award in Product Design in 2015, the first African American designer in that category. And I don't know if you know Stephen, but I was on the jury actually, and. <laughs> Really, uh, you didn't know, so that we're revealing many things. But I, I really remember uh, being smitten by your work, uh, especially the video um, that you submitted, which showed a kind of very unique and personal process, especially for the time. I mean, this was um, this was 2015, and you were already you were you were really clearly investigating issues of form, color, materiality, structure. Uh, but you also already were speaking about process and the story and life uh, of, of the making of objects and who makes them uh, and how, um, and, and insisting on bringing craft and design together in a way that I don't think people were already kind of questioning these, um, these ideas uh, in, in the kind of thoroughness that, um, that you brought. And so um, I guess the, the first question I would ask is, I know you've said that in this bridging of design and craft is a kind of position for you that design is sort of a Western concept. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I wanted to start there in terms of how your kind of your work undermines and decenters 
um, that idea. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, let me let me start by thanking you, Amal, for inviting me to be here um, at my alma mater. <laughs> I'm really excited to uh, to be talking at the GSAP, um, even virtually. Uh, and and um, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, when I think about uh, design as a Western concept, um, I have to return to IIT and the Institute of Design and start with uh, the Bauhaus um, and, and this idea that uh, a new profession could be invented around ways of using material, around ways of engaging industry, um, around ways of creating new concepts for products that we didn't even know we needed or didn't even know existed. And this was very much about the invention of the modern, right? This was very much about the translation of uh, the Industrial Revolution into um, what the 20th century became. Uh, now we enter the 21st century, and, uh, and I can say that up until 2005, I was working fairly traditionally. Um, I wasn't really thinking about another kind of context outside of Europe. In fact, when I started, um, a designer here in New York pretty much had to go to Europe to kind of make a name for himself or herself. And, uh, and I really, uh, I looked up to all of those companies which were very much rooted in Italy. And I, as I had lived in Milan um, in the mid nineties, designing watches for Swatch, believe it or not, <laughs> um, right after Colombia, uh, I moved to, to, to Milan. Um, I, I have to say I was, I was very much enamored with the system of production and uh, marketing and really design that, that Milan created. Uh, and so, you know, when you, when you think that uh, Italy is a country um, like the size of California and uh, most of the brands that we know of that are of significance were founded uh, around uh, post-war. So I think, uh, Bimbi Italia, 1966, um, Sony, 1953, Moroso, 1953. Um, so these brands really, for me, were rooted in craft. And uh, it's something that I realized later after, after making a few things and, uh, and having the opportunity to work first in South Africa. Mm -hmm. So it was that trip to South Africa that, that uh, kind of awakened me to another way of making, a way of making that was connected to uh, the hand and, and very, very separate from any kind of a academic reference. Um, a way of making that was, uh, for me, proof that everyone's capable of design. Um, and if we look at all of the, the countries outside of uh, Europe and America, um, what we call the developing world, which really we should call the majority world, <laughs> All of these other places, people have been making things uh, in traditional ways for generations. And uh, everyone's a designer. And everyone's somehow um, solving a problem uh, through design, a problem that's connected to their community, a problem that's connected to their way of life, um, a problem that they don't think of as design, uh, making products that have meaning in their lives. And uh, that was a big question mark for me. That was a really big, like, wow there's another way of looking at design. And, and it, I'm also, uh, you mentioned the Bauhaus. There was also a kind of very big split between design and architecture. Uh, yeah. Actually, women were designers and could do fabrics and textile and couldn't do yeah. architecture. And, um, and so I, I wanted to kind of, I know you've talked a lot about that relationship about, you know, of design to architecture and you started as, as, as an architect. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess I, I, um, I quickly understood that I was much more interested in the scale of the body, um, the scale of the hand, the scale of the interior, the places where we live, uh, the places where the things around us uh, are an expression of who we are. Um, architecture to me became and it's hard because growing up in Chicago, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm surrounded by some of the most beautiful examples of, of modernist architecture. And Mies van der Rohe's presence really loomed large. I mean, I chose IIT because of Crown Hall. I didn't apply to any other school in undergrad. Um, but once I got there, um, I realized that, that there wasn't enough humanity in architecture. <laughs> I know that sounds like a funny way to say it, but, but um, 
you know, I, I really believe that we're all responsible for the city that we live in. We're all uh, somehow, um, you know, players in the urban fabric and at whatever level that is. And, and so, you know, to be a person in the world and to live in a city and to kind of understand architecture um, is one scale. Uh, but then we go deeper into the communities and into the individuals and we understand people um, much more intimately at the, uh, the design scale. So I'm looking at these beautiful images and I, I, I love the process images and, you know, where you, you, le you know, I, I've always actually dreamt of hairy architecture, you know, things that are <laughs> not perfectly finished or complete. And yeah. I think you, you, you play a little bit with that. Um, take us through a, a process or, you know, what, what is the story of a, of an well, I, sh I should probably start by explaining uh, that this is really a kind of stream of consciousness. Um, I, I, because I don't believe in monologues, I, I kind of also don't believe in a, in a, a linear way of looking at my work because I'm, I'm actively working on so many different kinds of things. I mean, we've had moments where we're working on fragrance packaging, um, an exhibition interior, um, lighting, furniture, et cetera, all at the same time. And, and my own personal interest in, you know, thinking about uh, my education and how linear education is, right? My own personal interests have always been much more diverse than the education I've been immersed in. And so, um, you know, you're seeing images of process, you're seeing images of products, you're seeing um, snapshots from <laughs> my recent family vacations. Uh, you know, all of these things feed my creative impulse. And um, when I think about process, uh, I have to say that we have to remember that architecture is creative. Ar architecture is a creative act. It isn't, it isn't like uh, a startup. It isn't like um, simply, you know, developing a building. It's, 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 it's very, it can start from, you know, a brick. It can start from clay. It can start from an idea. And, and uh, the same is true uh, for design. Um, and so if I think about one of these particular objects, uh, I guess I could talk a bit about Daydon, um, who's been my number one client for years. Uh, and they give me the, uh, the access to go into the field and work in the way that I'm most comfortable, which is a kind of workshop-based practice. And so all of these process images you're seeing, regardless of the brand, are the way that uh, we typically engage a, a product. So we start by sketching, of course. We start with you know, it, it could be anything that kind of starts us uh, in terms of the idea. But when we go to the factory, that's when the project really begins. Um, like going down to Berea, Kentucky, uh, when we saw each other recently, I was just coming from Berea, and we're working with um, Berea College, uh, Berea Student Crafts there, on a project called uh, Crafting Diversity. And that is very much tied to um, the college's commitments, great commitments as the first integrated college in the South since I think 1855. Um, but then also tied to, I think, what the students need today and, uh, and what, you know, in a sense, our whole country needs today, right? We're all coming to this awakening that we, you know, design is, is not a very diverse discipline. It's kind of just being discovered by um, other kinds of people. Um, not very many people of color, obviously, not very many women working in design. And, uh, and so Crafting Diversity for us um, was a project that uh, was conceived by Glenn Adamson and John Prown, Glenn Adamson, the design historian, uh, John Prown from the Chipstone Foundation, um, Megan Doherty, who is, uh, I think, the curator at the art museum at the school, and uh, Aaron Beal, who's the director of Student Craft. And they reached out to me um, to kind of uh, engage me in a, a year-long process of, of working with the students in a participatory way uh, to develop uh, totally new products that could not only speak to the, the great commitments and their diversity, but also speak to um, a new way of making at the school. And it's almost as if I've translated <laughs> my way of working directly into their way of working. So um, we've, we've uh, We've got products now where the students are um, involved creatively. Uh, and so like the artisan communities I've worked with around the world, the students are directly 
um, serving as uh, what I call hand factories. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so hand factory, meaning the hand has power, the hand has uh, creativity, the hand is not the machine. And so the students can, in many of the products or some of the products, actually change the design according to um, you know, their own creativity. So that's, I guess, a long-winded <laughs> answer to your question. I took you through a lot of things. No, no, that, that's very interesting. So it's a kind of, uh, so you're setting up a process uh, by which ev every hand has, is part of it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, 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 would you say that it's almost like a slightly collaborative design process or? Oh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's intended, it was intended to be completely collaborative, um, but you know, it's, it's a little bit tricky because I've tried so many different ways um, to execute ideas like this in the field, um, in Senegal, um, yeah. in, in Colombia, in the Philippines. Um, we've probably been most successful in the, in the Philippines with Dadon uh, because we're developing a product and I have a lot of freedom and I'm learning so much from the artisans there. But in the case of the students, you know, they were a bit shy. And um, here I am, big designer coming from New York and um, not dictating uh, what should be done, but, but really trying to kind of open the book for the first time for them and say, hey, if you were to participate in this design process, what would you make? Right. Um, and so we did uh, several workshops over the year um, where the students were, we're drawing, um, sketching, trying to kind of imagine, and and there is no design. Um, well, there is there is an industrial design program there at the school, but uh, we didn't have any designers uh, in our workshops. So students were coming from biology, from English, um, and the work study program there is uh, is how the tuition is paid. Uh, Rio College is completely tuition free, so that's an aspect that I forgot to mention. Um, and so, you know, the students came, but I also had to bring ideas to kind of engage and initiate the process, which is a lot of how I'm working in the field. So you bring ideas and then you kind of engage in the process. And how are you working? I mean, I joked a little bit about your traveling, but in this, yeah. we were going to talk, you know, in this moment of being very connected and completely disconnected, how are you maintaining your commitment to working with artisans all over the world and well Amal it's 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 challenging you know it's really challenging um I think the brands uh that we're working with now are are looking at new ways of launching products um in order to make space for new products right now um believe it or not we're busy uh we've gotten a lot of attention recently and and a lot of companies are still um we all thought in the home furnishings business, right, that COVID would be the death of us. Um, and the first quarter, we saw our royalties drop uh, by a third. But then by the second quarter, right, things had already picked up. Um, and second quarter of COVID, which is actually third quarter of the year. Um, and so all around the world, people are uh, confronting their domestic lives again, right? And they're kind of coming to terms with how they're living and what they're living with. And, and uh, a lot of people are choosing to renovate and a lot of people are buying new furniture. And if you're working from home, you kind of have to reinvent your office space. And so there's been a boom in the home furnishings industry. And uh, as a result, we've gotten a lot of new projects. Now those projects aren't ones where we can practice our traditional process. Um, we were already involved with Berea. So uh, we were, you know, the plans were already in place for us to go down and our, our final trip was delayed because of COVID. Um, and we had the, uh, the special attention of uh, PBS and Craft in America, um, who came down and kind of trailed us. And I believe on December 11th, uh, they'll be showing um, our work on the Craft in America on PBS, which is great. Um, but, but in other cases, we've had to work in different ways. And I think, you know, looking at the home as a laboratory um, is what it's been about, you know. Uh, I'm telling my team not to get stuck. Uh, <laughs> and this is, you know, for me, this is advice uh, across the board. I think these are really challenging times, but they're really exciting times. Um, you know, we have to imagine that 
out of all of this chaos and, and out of all of this difficulty are going to come new ways of working, new ways of producing, totally new products, um, new architecture, uh, et cetera. And it's really important not to get stuck. So I'm working more as an artist these days. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm making things myself. I'm, I'm prototyping, I'm working in paper, I'm doing more drawing than I have in years. Um, and it's so exciting, you know, to see <laughs> what I can come up with on my own, right? And so um, communicating with my team via WhatsApp, as I guess we all are, um, there's a lot of that, which I think creates interesting opportunities to also communicate with artists and groups. And that's something that we've begun to think about. So almost like a, a correspondence craft, you could call it. Yeah, that's very, that's very <laughs> interesting because for someone who is so committed to the materiality, you know, uh, to find a way to, to work through correspondence, uh, I, I think is kind of really interesting. And I, uh, I know you've been working with Friedman Benda as well and hosting their um, design talk um, series and uh, kind of working on a, on a show, I hope, or, you know, and so the kind of your artist self is also, uh, uh, and one of the um, quote uh, that I enjoyed uh, reading recently, and it's something that we, we talk about, we've talked about at the school is the notion of uh, how does one construct a practice and how does one construct you know, their own practice to engage um, issues, to engage the world, to engage architecture. And you, you said um, to the question, this was a interview by Surface Magazine, uh, what is the most important thing you've designed to date? And you said, well, I'm still in the process of designing my own career. Uh, and I and thought this, but that was very interesting because you, you mentioned how um, the path that you've taken is not, you know, linear and you're really kind of, and you see the, the show here, you're kind of really hybridizing um, the personal, the political, you're working across scales, you're kind of bringing craft and, you know, making a statement about craft as design, being extremely local, but also completely global in your network. I mean, kind of, kind of pushing back on, on sort of, a, um, sort of assumptions. And so, um, yeah. Anyway, I just wanted to, to think about also for our students, like today there is, as you said, it's such a difficult time, but also such a time of, uh, of change and demand for change and, you know, yeah. and how, how to channel that in the skills and ways of thinking and making that we have. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I think the scariest uh, notions that I'm hearing in the world are that people want things to be the way that they were. Um, I think change is the only true constant, and, and I, I don't know about you, but as, as much as it's been a volatile moment and there have been some really tragic events, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm driven to do more. Um, I'm driven to make, uh, you know, completely new future uh, for myself and my community. And, and uh, you know, the, 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 what I'm finding is that uh, I seem to have more of a voice <laughs> and and it's it's interesting to discover new ways of communicating right um, design is a form of communication as well and so you know I'm, I'm not only working at multiple scales and working locally and, and internationally but but I'm also working on um, being in touch with a broader community um, Speaking here at the GSAP with you, Amal, is part of that. Uh, design and dialogue, as you mentioned, is part of that. Um, being able to, uh, you know, work with my partner here um, on, uh, you know, the reinvention of kind of our domestic space as a laboratory is part of that. My my 15 year old son living with us is part of that. You know, is kind of like a cross generational, uh, <laughs> you know, design studio here these days. Um, it's, it's, I think, all um, very, very interesting. And I guess I can say that um, when I think about me still designing my career, uh, I, I never really thought that I'd be a designer. Um, I actually went, after finishing in product design, I went back to, I went to grad school, right, to be an architect. And uh, I never really 
had a picture of what a design career looked like. Um, and I think that young people need to see examples of what a design career can look like. And, and, uh, and I think it's important that, at least in my work, that I show um, a, di a diverse range of possibilities. Um, not just in terms of materials and processes, but, but in terms of collaborators, right? Um, it's not always just about luxury brands and big names. It, it's also about um, being of service and, and connecting, uh, I guess, on a, on a deeper level to people who are, um, in many ways, the artisans are like mentors to me, right? So teaching me things that I could have never imagined on my own. Uh, and so, you know, we have to be willing to dream. We have to re-engage our imagination and we have to uh, consider that there's, there's new ways of, uh, of having a career that haven't been invented yet. <laughs> you weren't very happy in your studies at Columbia to study. Well, uh, you know, I, I actually, I don't want to get too much into that, but, but I can say I'm that. Sorry um, for any. No, no. <laughs> any, any abuse that I, that I suffered at the hand of uh, Bernard Schumi and, and yeah. company. Um, well, it was the early 90s, you know, it was a, it was a paperless studio. Um, I went in thinking that, okay, now coming from product design, where the focus of my work was like technology and space, I came to Columbia thinking, okay, this is the perfect place to, you know, to study that. And I remember, I'm going to date myself dramatically here, uh, but I remember driving to the MoMA in 1989 uh -huh. in the dead of winter with my two best friends at the time. Um, in a little BMW and uh, to see the deconstructivist architecture show. And uh, that show, um, you know, really brought to light the idea of going to Columbia, of living in New York, of, of being an architect. But of course, I'm looking at work that, <laughs> you know, I'm looking at the Zaha Hadid's of the world. I'm looking at Daniel Liebeskin. I'm looking at, you know, his amazing drawings and the paintings that Zaha showed. And, uh, you know, I'm looking at, uh, at work that, wasn't traditional architecture. And so I went into Columbia thinking, oh yeah, this is the place where, you know, I can sort of be free and, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna paint my drawings. I'm not gonna. <laughs> <laughs> and of course it was no paper allowed. It was really a bizarre situation. Um, just the opposite of what I needed, you know? And um, at IIT in architecture, it was very much about the art and science of building. Um, we did full scale brick details and sections through a building. We had um, <clears throat> visual training courses that came straight from the Bauhaus, you know, two lines on a, on a 20 by 30 board for three weeks. <laughs> it was incredible. It was incredible. But it was highly, for me, it was, it was uh, formational because it was, it was a kind of foundation of, of the history of design. Um, and, I guess where I excelled at Columbia, where I, I enjoyed uh, the, the, the studies the most was probably the history and theory sequence, right? Mm -hmm. um, I remember taking the visions of the real seminar and, and you know, learning that all of these modernist houses were in polychrome. Uh, so there were some things that inspired me that I took with me <laughs> as I ran from that place to Milan <laughs> to do other things, you know? But, um, I, what I find really interesting is that architects uh, typically aren't so concerned with the interior uh, these days. Um, I think in the, the early um, days of modernism, right, the architect was doing everything. And, uh, and so thinking about, I've been to Alvar Aalto's uh, little summer house on the lake in Uvescala and seeing the door handle that he designed. You know, seeing all of the aspects of the house that he designed, he created, and and I know that it's 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 difficult to imagine how we can bring craft to architecture today, but I think we have to try. Um, I think we have to return to this moment where you know the architect was deeply involved in in all aspects of the building, and and not just kind of writing it off and and you know, right. hoping someone else will do a great job there. So. You know, it's very interesting because I think in a way, the way I see it is things are not coming back, but um, certain, certain things are coming back in a, in a new way 
right. uh, to reconnect us. So, for example, craft is not just about being, you know, connected to materiality or it's no longer, you know, the authenticity of the brick or, but it's rather what, what, what went into the making of the brick? How much energy did it take to make the brick? Who yeah. made the brick? You know, what conditions were the bricks made? You know, the, 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 the questions that you engage in, in your work. And so I think, I think architecture and certainly architecture students and, you know, are trying to, to kind of look, look at the, that trajectory of a material. Yeah. So I, I, wanna, I wanna redesign the brick. <laughs> right. And that with all these things, you know, take into account uh and and you know so i think i think that's you know that's one aspect um and the other is um talking about the paperless studio and you know it's it, it's very interesting i really um i mean obviously this is a really intense moment of uh kind of technological experiment in terms of communication but um the the making, you know, over the past few years at the school has really hybridized, you know, it's not like fabrication is, uh, is uh, that everything has to be, uh, you know, in the fab lab or whatever. The right. students are really kind of hybridizing the, the sketch and the collage and the, you know, the it kind of much more free. Absolutely. And that's where I think the potential really lies in like getting the hand closer to the act of making again and looking at that space between technology, craft and community. Right. Like where, where all these these three come together, um, there's a lot of play. There's a lot of room to, to, to play. Um, there's a lot of room for experimentation. Um, and that's that's super exciting. Uh, what's happening at the Chisa. Absolutely. So, uh, but but. Okay, now that you've mastered the scale of design, <laughs> are you are you tempted by the scale of architecture? I am. No, no, no. I think about, <laughs> I think about it all the time. You know, what I what I think about most is designing my own house, um, and and I have this dream of you know the Costa Brava in, in Spain, and and, <laughs> and of course it's a glass house, right? So you can see all the beautiful things inside. Um, but it's it's almost like um, the challenge there would be how to uh, not just focus on the transparency of the architecture, but but yeah. to to kind of play with that transparency, right? To play with it's 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 Annie Albers. It's the pliable plane. You know that's that's where my mind goes um, to a place where all of the surfaces are somehow mutable and and all of the systems are are really interwoven and uh, and it's it's a kind of um, yeah it's a bit of a dream <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> It's very interesting because you have you you did take something from the nineties the surface uh, language but okay, okay. <laughs> but, but no but I, I think it's very interesting because you took it in a completely different place mm. uh, of of interweaving and creating um, you know volume as opposed to you know I mean I'm just going back to your deconstructivist show idea of right, right, right. exploding surfaces as a as a kind of undoing of a certain kind of architecture, right? This sort of mm -hmm. postmodern, um, but you sort of brought it, brought, you know, wove it back, you know, and you wove, you know, you wove things back together. I have to say, I have to say that, I mean, it may not look like it, but every single one of my products is a little building. It's a little, it's a, <laughs> it's a tiny little building, you know, because there's so much, um, I'm, I'm always thinking at the, at the detail level, uh, but I'm always trying to generate structure somehow. And, and that's something that I can't, I, I haven't been able to remove uh, from my work. And even though you see color and you see pattern and you see all of this weaving, I mean, this is this table for me, for example, is the, the new National Gallery. And it's like, you know, there are ideas there that, that, that are obviously coming from architecture that are always deeply uh, in me. Um, and I'm not so interested in form for form's sake. I'm interested in form as an expression of, of the structure, right? Uh, so even when I had to work in Alabaster on this jewelry box for Harry Winston, you know, we were, 
we were carving away at the material to, to reveal the structure, right? Mm -hmm. So there, you know, when you look at those, those chairs or the baskets, it's like there's something about that, that micro scale and how structure can be developed as a surface that's completely pliable and mutable and, and can take any form that, that we want to give it. And that, that to me is uh, it's very exciting. So um, I don't know, it's, I think to be able to make space in, in an architectural education for, for students to explore um, new ways of developing structure, right? That, that may, not, may not relate to a building um, in the same semester. <laughs> Maybe they relate to a building, you know, years from now. Um, but, but I think it's, it's important. I think it's really important uh, to be able to play. And um, you've also said that, you know, design has really been, and you've talked about it a little bit, uh, a way to explore your own identity. Mm -hmm. um, and I see, you know, protest um, yeah. signs. Yeah. And yeah. what does it mean? Yeah, right. Well, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, for me, it's all connected, right? Um, that, that, that design, and all of this work cannot possibly exist outside of the society I'm living in. Um, architecture shouldn't be trying to exist outside of the society that it lives in. I mean, we design and produce the mechanisms and systems by which these things are possible. Um, you know, I'm fascinated by the, uh, the design of protest, for example. Uh, and, and, and I'm looking at, um, you know, my people in this country um, still fighting for equality. Uh, and, and it's just, it's, it's not just a, an equality of the body, although that's the immediate one, right? That, that we just want to live and exist in these spaces and feel safe, but it's also the equality of the mind and, and the freedom to have a different way of thinking, a different way of looking at the world um, where you can feel secure in that and you can say this is my culture and these are my beliefs and and we can be different from one another but still live together right um and so yeah we went out and we protested of course um the photographs you're seeing of the protests are by a young uh, brooklyn photographer malik sidi bay not the famous malian malik sidi bay <laughs> uh, but a much younger uh, one um, his work i've just started to collect and and I think he's, he's brilliant. Uh, I think it's important that, you know, young people are out there documenting what's going on. And, uh, and that is inspiring all of us. I mean, you know, looking at, um, thinking about um, buying art is, has been a way uh, for me to find joy um, amongst all of this. And, and making, of course, making uh, art or design as I call it, <laughs> so. And, you know, how we make and what we make and what we use, you know, is so tied. I'm thinking about the fires and, uh, I mean, it's unbelievable. We are in this moment, right, where, as you say, everything we do is, is you know, as designers and as architects is completely tied and to this, these, um, what we use and um, so, yeah. Is it interest? Is it? Is it? I mean, obviously, you've been thinking about that as well, right? Like. Yeah, I mean, that was kind of when, of course, you're relating to climate. You're you're speaking yeah. of climate change, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't really make sense for me to be flying all over the world, right? Yeah. It doesn't really make sense for these products to be flying all over the world, and um, you know, we're trying to operate in uh, a 21st century way with 20th century systems. And so, um, you know, part of my work when I was at Harvard as a Loeb Fellow was looking at um, ways to, to, to rethink uh, design and um, the distribution of products and, and even who, who the, the designers are, right? Like this statement I continue to make about everyone being capable of design. I mean, I think that that really is the future um, that in the future, we will all design our own products and, and those products will be made as locally as possible because, you know, there won't be another way that's viable 
right? And unfortunately, we may have to do away with leather chairs and <laughs> we have to do away with meat. And, you know, we just, you know, all of these things have to be reconsidered. And, and, uh, and that's what's, I think, so exciting about the student culture today. Um, you know, I was teaching in the Masters of Design Engineering at Harvard. And uh, there's a real sort of startup culture there. Um, the students are, are uh, young entrepreneurs, mostly. Um, and I also have been an expert in residence uh, at the Harvard Innovation Lab. And the students that I'm meeting very much want to get out there and change the world. And um, unfortunately, most of them think it's going to be through an app. <laughs> but, but, you know, if, if an app is just a window um, to a new system or a new mechanism, right, a new a, a platform as a means of, of breaking down the old ways of doing things and, and creating space for new ways of doing things, then I think it, it makes sense. Um, but we have to be careful of, of constantly wanting to connect it to capitalism, right? Um, I, I, I don't know, I, I recently interviewed uh, Pedro Reyes and yeah. uh, Fernandez down in Mexico, and uh, their approach has been very socialist. Um, I mean, she's a fashion designer working with, um, you know, dozens of different communities. Um, he's an architect and an artist. Uh, learning from different communities in terms of his stone production, et cetera. And, and uh, you know, their, their approach, I think, is, is one that, um, that uh, reminds me of my own. And I just haven't, I have to admit, a lot of the work that you're seeing um, are not the most successfully commercial thing. Yeah in the world <laughs> they 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 are they are what they are and they're 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 their experiments and i've learned quite a lot from them and, and uh and they continue to to move my practice forward well it's always this balance right of how do you support the kind of research practice uh, right. uh and uh while while maintaining a kind of commitment uh, um um, but these these images are really kind of beautiful and want us to go places. <laughs> we go I mean, <laughs> you know, you, you mentioned um, this balance between research and yeah. and and, uh, and business, and I, I think that in a lot of ways, research and business and um, and society, right, kind of have to come together in, in academia today in education today because the students are not just um they're capable of so much more and they want to do so much more and you know they they're living through i mean this this summer uh we haven't seen anything like this since 1968 right yeah. um it, it it i think speaks to uh, how much the world needs to change and so if the research component feeds into uh, the, the business component that then serves the community, right? Then I think we can find a kind of healthy balance. Um, and, and that's, if I were teaching at the GSAP, that's what yeah. I'd love to talk yeah. about. <laughs> I was, was going to say maybe before, I um, uh, want to make sure to open it up to questions. Uh, hmm. One, two questions. What would be, the first is what would be an ideal project for you today? Like if I, you know, what, yeah. Mm. Or something that you've never done that you, besides building your own house, which, mm. um, but you know, what would be something that you, that you would really want to do today? Um, I, I know a lot of people are working on this, but <clears throat> there, there has to be a reinvention of the fashion system. Yeah. Right. But I mean, that it's, it's so wasteful. I mean, it's among the top polluters in the world. And, uh, and, and I have to say, it's a little disheartening to see um, so many young people wearing sort of generic uh, made anywhere kind of uniforms that then are disposable. Um, you know, we're coming from a generation which, you know, we were much more aspirational in terms of <laughs> 
if I can afford this, I'm going to keep it forever. <laughs> and, uh, and so I think fashion um, is, is uh, an interesting area um, to explore um, from, from the ground up, right? From the yeah. textile level up. Uh, yeah, my, my partner is Cambodian and, uh, and a lot of uh, the you know, clothing today um, is being made in Cambodia. And so the textile workers um, need our help. Uh, I think there's a lot of room for redevelopment there. But then architecture has to be reinvented, right? Um, I'd love to just work on a little house, you know, uh, not to, was it Haydek who did House for a Hermit? Yes. I don't remember. Houses for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> he had one particular project, which was about a, a kind of house for a hermit, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. yes. Um, it was one yeah. of <laughs> so, so there's something about that. It would be a house for, for who? Or for well, what? It's, it's kind of like... Uh, you know, you, you, we don't want to be alone, right? We want to have uh, parties and we want to, you know, get together. Washington Square Park is like exploding with young people trying to kind of just gather and dance and have fun. Uh, and so something about the house and the club, I think could be fascinating today, right? Because I have to say, I really miss, I miss that kind of space in the city. Um, that's it, the 90s, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, <ate> both. <laughs> but those were good times, you know? Those were really good times. And not to be nostalgic, because that's not what we're here for. Um, but I think the, the social spaces need to be reinvented. We need to think about how we gather um, successfully and, and how we gather healthily and, and how we how we share in those spaces, right? Those were really creative places of, of invention, um, not just physical invention in terms of dance, but, but uh, just the way that people related to one another, you know, in terms of design and, and fashion and, and communication. And there were all of these, um, I don't know, uh, you know, there was that recent exhibition at the Vitro Design Museum around the club, uh, which was pretty interesting and I think I don't know, was a little bit nostalgic as well. <laughs> but I, I think how we come together uh, is, is a question uh, for design and, and architecture. Um, and, uh, and so, okay, my last question before opening it up, yeah. uh, what would be a dream studio uh, to, for, with students or what, what would you want to push? I'd, I'd love to work with that essay, that Annie Albers essay, The Pliable Plane. I'd love to revisit that, right? But, but from, from a real detailed level in terms of materiality, right? Like what, I don't know what it is, but <laughs> that would be a lot of fun. That would really be a lot of fun to see that develop into architecture. Well, Stephen, let me, uh, 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 let me ask a few uh, few questions. Sure. Maybe we can just keep the slides playing because there's a lot more yeah. that you guys haven't seen. <laughs> sure, sure. sure. Um, uh, the first uh, is, what is your relationship to natural materials, uh, mm -hmm. the clay and the reeds, etc., and other contextual resources that are more freely available in Africa? And, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a question about uh, say regionalism as opposed to exoticism mm -hmm. uh, and also to add in terms of the basket pattern language do you feel it could find a relationship to architecture I guess it's a question about weaving and natural yeah. materials and how you're engaging um, with these kinds of patterns I learned so much working in Senegal I mean I guess it's in reference to a lot of the images that they've been seeing of me uh, working with basket weavers in Senegal um, but the Senegalese are really difficult uh, to work with <laughs> at that scale, at least the ones, the communities I was engaging. So I worked in the second city of Chase in little villages outside of Chase. Um, and, you know, for me, the point was to obviously use uh, sweetgrass because that's, that's what all of the baskets uh, were being made from. And it's important to say that all of those baskets here, you see another image, um, 
are made without any written record. Um, yeah. like the form, the pattern, uh, the, they weave the form, the pattern, and the color simultaneously without a drawing. Um, the, the drawings that I brought to uh, these little villages were the first time they had ever worked in drawing. And uh, so there is a, a kind of, there's, it's communicated, um, it, you know, the difference between knowledge and wisdom, right? It's just passed down. And uh, I don't have a particular relationship to natural uh, materials. And I, I'm only, I'm only interested in kind of pushing the material to its, its limit in a sense. Um, but I work with the material of the cultures that I'm engaged in. Um, I don't have any examples here in the images, but in Colombia, we worked with uh, weavers that were coming out of the Amazon with a technique called Wedege. And Wedege, if you're not familiar, I mean, I, I have no idea this existed, but you know, it is such a dense form of weaving um, that it, it, the, the vessels feel like uh, ceramic. Um, they, they feel like plastic and they're all made from natural fibers that are, many of which are naturally dyed. And they're making vessels that are from a foot tall to three feet tall. Um, something that's that big takes several people months to make. Wow. Um, and it's, I think there's so much uh, in terms of indigenous cultures that we can learn from. There's that great book, uh, Low Tech, that came out recently. No relation to Low Tech, the architects. Yeah. And my friend... Ada, who might be listening. <laughs> um, question and comment, lovely pres presentation, some personal queries. What poetry and literature have impacted you most? And what are you currently reading? And do you carry a daily sketchbook? Mm, wow, those are great questions. Um, really to the core. <laughs> um, I'm a big fan of uh, the music of my youth, the music I grew up with, the music my mom was listening to. Um, I tell my son all the time that anything you want to know about, you know, black people in America is in our music. And that's the poetry that speaks mostly uh, to me. Um, uh, I recently saw the documentary, I'm Not Your Negro, uh, James Baldwin. I'm reading the book. Um, I'm reading so many things at the same time. It's a little bit, it's a little bit embarrassing. Um, and I'm reading, um, I had the, the, the recent uh, pleasure of becoming friends with Bell Hooks. Um, and Bell is down in Berea College um, uh, in Berea, Kentucky. She lives there and the, the Bell Hooks Institute is there. And so my partner and I are just re reading or reading for the first time many of Bell's works. There's a great conversation, a uh, little pamphlet that she published from the Institute between her and Cornel West, which is incredible. Um, Cornel West is a big inspiration uh, of mine. Um, and then there was, what was the third? Oh, my sketchbook. So I have a lot of sketchbooks. I have, um, there's one. <laughs> I'm reaching back into Satsas' house to pull out my sketchbook. Let's see. I don't know. Can you see it? <laughs> Designed such as house. That's right. That's right. Um, anyway, I, I, I buy these small. Um, yeah. Is it one kind of sketchbook? Yeah, I use the Muji sketchbooks that are like the medium size. They're about an inch thick and they're like um, six by eight inches. Uh, something about that size I really like. Um, I'm working now on a big drawing for uh, Fibberut, for Beirut. Okay. Architects for Beirut, <laughs> which, uh, so, yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 but we have, we have a huge library, and um, someone told me years ago that uh, a child that grows up with access to a library will um, just be more intelligent and empathetic and insightful, and so, um, I've been a bibliophile my whole life. I worked in the library when I was at IIT and, and it's a bit of a burden, you know, but it's something that like, I have to carry with me. Like, my yeah. books are kind of my life and, and they're, they're, they're reference material and they're also like, you know, sit down and spend hours, but 
it, it varies. I'm sure you're the same way. <laughs> it's a generational thing. It is. It, it is. is. Although I think I think I think this generation is reading quite quite a lot as well, which is amazing. Yeah. The book yeah. didn't die. So no, the book didn't die, but the 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 the, the book Pack Rat maybe did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um. Uh. Do you have ideas about how design might contribute to or potentially solve global warming? That's a question. Mm, wow, that's a really big question. Um, I was in conversation with Beatrice Galilee uh, recently and uh, her project, The World Around, if you're familiar with that, uh, the conference that she, she did, which came out of um, a day in the life of architecture she was doing at the Met. And, uh, when she was writing about architecture years ago, um, she did a story about up and coming practices. And the cover of the magazine said, if uh, you want to save the world, don't build anything. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, how do you, how do, you do that? Um, I think that's true of, of almost all of the things that we enjoy. Um, mankind on earth, uh, for better or for worse, um, can only do harm. Uh, it's kind of a negative way to end, but, <laughs> but, 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 you know, we can also express our dreams in the process, right? So we can't not build, we can't not design and make, and we can't not eat, but we have to find smarter ways of doing that. And, uh, and I think that's, I, I love the sensitive nature of that question. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. Maybe tying it in a way to, to this other question, which is maybe a little bit more um, kind of tangible. Can you discuss how design at multi-scalar approaches can heal fractured cities and communities? I, I think you're trying to do that in mm -hmm. your, through the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we would love to collaborate with um, architects. Um, and our goal is now to try to work at the scale of the building and look at a community-based project. Like, is it possible when a building's being built to uh, not just, you know, grant permission and, and, uh, and allow the developer to have at it, but to force the developer and the building to give back to the community? And one way of doing that could be to engage the people uh, in the community that need work uh, in the production of the, the building itself. And it can be a long-term project. I mean, you know, these buildings are taking, you know, in some cases, three to five years to complete. And so if, you're, if you have a design process that's that long, we as architects have to engage in, in bringing craft and bringing the community into it as soon as possible. And, and that may require like restructuring, uh, you know, the economics of the project, right? Um, but wouldn't it be beautiful if the people in public housing built the public housing? Mm -hmm. and, and if they not only built it, but they built it from the inside out, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, could have a say over how they're living and what they're living with. Um, and play a role in, I mean, imagine how much more you appreciate your, your home if you participate in building it. So that's the scenario that I'd like to kind of push for. Um, I don't know how to do that just yet, but <laughs> that's where we'd like to be. Um, that's a great, that's a nice maybe question to uh, start ending on. Um, how would you go about building a doghouse? That's a question that we got, seriously? Yeah, that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> or is that? <laughs> it's a, you know, our first project was a doghouse. So oh, yeah? <laughs> I take this question very seriously. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I don't mean to laugh. That's really funny. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, because you can't really speak to the client, can you? Right? So what is a doghouse? Um, a doghouse is the expression of the architect's imagination at a different scale, I suppose. Um, so I, 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 we've been, um, I don't know if this is related, but we've been playing with Jenga blocks lately, uh, <laughs> and, uh, exploring certain things with little Jenga blocks. And 
I don't know, it'd be funny to make a dog house that's somehow mutable, right? That the dog could shape just by being inside. Um, I think I was a dog in my past life, actually. Yeah, I, I think it's, I mean, I don't want to, but it is interesting as architects and designers to think about building for non-human, I mean, <laughs> other species, right? If we're going to be caretakers. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and, um, Absolutely. Uh, and uh, um, maybe one last question. Uh, do you use design and craft interchangeably? Uh, hmm. uh, and if if not, I guess you, the lecture, you know, what is really the difference between the two? I mean, that this is something that you're, um, but yeah. you, you use them interchangeably. Yeah, I mean, you know, I try not to think of design as being defined by the limits of its definition. <laughs> you know what I mean? I try to think of design as being a lot more expansive and and so there I think there's some crossover right so there's a certain point where um, you know a sketch changes from being designed to become craft and and it's kind of about how you what your intention is I suppose right so so and, and how you how you express yourself in that medium um, I guess you could be working in craft and, and it's just purely design, but. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's an interesting question. I mean, your, your uh, project question. is to blur the boundaries between. Right, the right, absolutely. Uh, uh, okay, one last question. Although you've said that your work hasn't been commercially successful, which is not entirely true, by the way, oh, no. uh, we can find value in other ways uh beyond economic value obviously in your estimation what has been your most successful project mm. or wow. it's hard to yeah yeah i mean it I, I i can't really speak to the commercial success but and this is maybe um a little personal but but my the chair that my son loves the most is <laughs> is not my favorite at all, but but it's it's somehow like important to me Your because son's favorite. So. Yeah, because it's his favorite, you know, and it's and 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 it's not so much. I know it sounds like it's really about him being my son, but it's also about the fact that as a designer, you know, to have real feedback is mm -hmm. uh, it changes how you see your work. Um, and most of the time we have no idea how people are living with our things. And so to have to be living with our things here and have him around, uh, you know, and talking about what's his favorite, what he likes, what he doesn't like, changes my opinion of it <laughs> and of its success. So the last is not a um, question, it's a comment. Hi, Stephen. As I recall, we chewed through a lot of paper at GSAP. <laughs> oh yeah. So, uh, maybe you know the person, but uh, uh, well, Stephen, thank you so much. Uh, it was really wonderful uh, to have you, even virtually at GSAP, but yeah. um, really kind of uh, threading through <laughs> so many, um, so many dimensions that uh, I think we aspire to engage as architects and you're doing it like just beautifully, but also just with the kind of level of commitment and com complexity uh, from, from the process to the actual object. And uh, it's really wonderful uh, to see and really inspiring, I think, as a first lecture as we enter this complex semester but with you know dreams and aspirations for hopefully what what we can weave forward <laughs> beyond, beyond this moment uh, uh, kind of building on as you said and uh, on, on on the change that's that's burning so um, and hopefully we'll welcome you back in the spring I hope with some some in person, uh, and uh, it's been just wonderful to have you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ma. Thank you. It's been great. I missed a lot of fun. Yeah.
big clapping in wood, but imagine <laughs> an audience of, uh, of claps, so. All right, all right. Even. Okay. Thank you, thank Bye. you. Thanks, Columbia. Thanks, Gisa. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. Okay. See you soon.